Math 43, let's take a look at example two. And one of the things I want us to be on the listen for as I read this is, which land are we in? Are we in mean land or proportion land? And towards the end of chapter seven, we started to ask those questions. Uh, am I mean land or am I in proportion land? Another way of asking that would be to say, well, what was my variable? Did I have a numerical variable or did I have a categorical variable? And those were our two sampling distributions, right? We either had the sampling distri for distribution for means or the sampling distribution for proportions. Those were those last two columns on that giant trait table I gave us that covered us through chapters four through seven. And that's where we left off and that's exactly where we're picking up. Am I a mean land or proportion land? And from here through the rest of the chapters, that's the question you wanna ask yourself first. So, oops, I accidentally scooted that up. All right, so, Let's try and read this question, okay? And then, like I said, I want us to answer this. Am I in mean land or am I in proportion land? Or another way of asking that is do I have a numerical variable or a categorical variable? So I don't know which, which version makes more sense in your head when you do it, but, but find one that works for you and stick to it. So here we go. Despite protests from civil libertarians and gay rights activists, many people favor mandatory AIDS testing of certain at-risk groups, and some people even believe that all citizens should be tested. What proportion of adults in the United States favor mandatory testing for all citizens? To assess public opinion on this issue, researchers conducted a survey of 1,014 randomly selected adult U.S. citizens. The article reported that 466 of the 1,014 people surveyed believe that all citizens should be tested, use this information to estimate P, the true proportion of all U.S. citizens. All right, so that is a bunch of information to take in, but I'm hoping a couple of words stood out to you. All right, so when I ask, am I a mean land or proportion land? If I wanted to look at this question in this version, all right, at least first, I, I would hope the word proportion stood out to us, right? I saw proportion there, I saw proportion down here, and I also saw the letter P, all right? And that is a great way of recognizing, hey, I'm in proportion land. So I'm gonna write that on the margins. I always write little notes to myself. You're gonna see me talk about, there's basically gonna be three notes I write over here, which land I'm in, which critical value letter I'm using. We haven't done that yet, but we will. And then how many samples do I have? All right, so we're gonna, you're gonna see me put typically three things over here. They're just notes to myself. It's not something all stats teachers do. It just always helped me organize my thoughts when I was trying to figure this stuff out. So I'm definitely in proportion land. Okay. Now, if I was asking this question, but through this lens of, was my variable numerical or categorical? Well, let's think, what were we asking these 1,014 people, all right? So I'll put that over here. In this case, my variable was whether or not these adults thought that we should have mandatory AIDS testing for all citizens, right? So whether or not there should be mandatory AIDS testing. Okay, and that's a categorical variable. So once I see that I'm, I've got a categorical variable, I know I'm in proportion land because people are either gonna answer yes or no, or maybe there's an option of I don't care but we can see by the wording of the problem, we're concerned with those who believed all citizens should be tested. So they're counting that as a success in the context of this question. Okay, so we've got that. We know our variable's categorical. We're definitely in proportion land. It says use this information to estimate P, the true proportion of all U.S. citizens. So when I want to estimate P, keep in mind P is a parameter. The only way I could have actually found this number is to run the census, meaning I have to tra track down all U.S. citizens and ask them. I don't want to do that. 
All right, instead I'm gonna go after this random sample and when I estimate P, we estimate it with a statistic, right? I'm not gonna run the census, I'm just gonna use my sample data and maybe you heard the number, it was 466 out of 1,014. So let's see what that number gets us. Oh gosh, oops, dropped it. <laughs> All right, let me get this back in even. There we go. So we had, what was it, 466 out of 1,014. We had about 46%. Okay. So based on my sample, I think, well, definitely 46% of my sample may um, favor mandatory AIDS testing. But we, we're going to use this number to estimate the, the parameter, the, the proportion of all U.S. citizens. So is this point estimate 100% accurate? And what I'm trying to get at here is if I did run the census, right? if I actually went to everybody, not just these 1,014 folks, but if I went to everybody, would I get exactly 46%? It's very unlikely, right? Probably not. So I'm going to say, is it 100% accurate? No. Could it be close? If I ran the census, could it be close to 46%? Yeah, it could, right? And it also could be very far off, I, I don't know. That's why I say, could it be close? Yes, it could be close, right? It really depends on how your sample was chosen. If these 1,014 people really represent all US citizens, then this number might be very close. If I have a bias in my sample, then that would lead to a bias in my statistic, right? If these 1,014 people just completely left out women or completely left out the elderly or, I don't know, completely left out Republicans or something to that effect, um, left out a group who, whose opinion might differ from the rest of the groups in, in all of the U.S. citizens, if there was some bias, some selection bias, then it's possible that this stat was terrible. But hopefully we chose this sample well, right? We chose it randomly to try and eliminate bias. So that's why I said, could it be close? Yes. If our sample is chosen well, P prime might be close to P. Okay. And and that's where stats comes from, like this study, uh, this, this science of statistics, is that we don't want to run the census. We'd like to avoid that for time and money reasons. So we can just get our information from a sample and say, well, it's close enough. Maybe I need a little bit of wiggle room. Then how wonderful would that be? It saves us, like I said, a lot of time and money. Now, I mentioned wiggle room way back in chapter one. All right. And we're going to revisit an example, an activity that we did in example one but I want to solidify wiggle room and then I'm going to make up some numbers, all right, just to show you where we're headed in chapter eight. But again, the, I'm, I'm making this up. So what I would say wiggle room, let's say I said I wanted 3% wiggle room, all right? This was 46%, all right? So our statistic, our point estimate was 46%. And what if I somehow calculated this? And again, we're going to actually come up with a formula here. But I said, well, I know I only got this from a sample. I didn't run the census. So this could be close, but maybe it's a little bit off. I know that when I'm just getting a statistic, I might have a little bit of error. Now, I would call that wiggle room. We're going to technically call that margin of error. So you're also going to hear this phrase pop up, margin of error. So let's say I had a 3% margin of error. That would mean that the parameter, the one I'm guessing, is somewhere between, all right, we had 46%, so I'm going to say 43% and 49%, okay? And where am I getting that number? I'm taking my point estimate, my statistic, and I'm subtracting my 3% margin of error, so 46 minus 3 is 43. I'm also taking my statistic and adding my margin of error, so 46 plus 3 is 49. So what we wind up saying in statistics is, yes, my sample had 46%, but I know it's just a sample. It's not 100% accurate. So I give myself a little bit of wiggle room, which we're going to call margin of error. And I will show you how to get this number. So I want to be super clear, made this up. All right, but if I did have a 3% margin of error, 
that I'm, what I'm saying is if I had run the census, I would have gotten a number between 43 and 49%. And that's called a confidence interval. All right, and I say interval because P could be any number on that x-axis between 0.43 and 0.49. All right, it's an interval, a confidence interval. And that's what we're gonna be doing in stats, or excuse me, in chapter eight, we're gonna get a statistic, add a margin of error, get an upper bound to our confidence interval, subtract a margin of error, get a lower bound to our confidence interval, and we'll say, hey, I think the parameter's in here. I'm not gonna run the census. This is just my best guess, or again, my best estimate. All right, and, and this 3% margin of error is gonna go back to um, our sampling distributions that we found in chapter seven. All right, because you can imagine, I, I had this 1,014 people, and this was the statistic I got. But let's say I took a different survey. I found another random sample of 1,014 people. I'm probably not going to get exactly 46%. Right? And I could keep running these samples after samples after samples, and I could graph all of my little sampling proportions. All right? And we did that with the Rhesus Pieces activity, and it would have its own little bell curve, all that fun stuff. But where I'm going with it, this formula will relate to sampling distributions for proportions. The stuff that we did in chapter seven is gonna help us calculate this number. All right, so with that, let's try and review up an activity we did really early on. Now, if you are in my face-to-face -face class, we did this in person. You had your own little Dixie cup of, of beads and we counted. If you are not in my face-to-face -face class, there's a video from chapter two, excuse me, from chapter one of me actually running this activity. And, and I'm gonna be playing that video as you hear me reading this, just to remind you of what I got way back in chapter two. Again, for my particular data set, you would have a different one due to sampling variability. But, but let's, let's read this. It says, so we are beyond interested in the proportion of red beads in this giant plastic container, beyond interested, right? Everyone wants to know the proportion of red beads and they need an answer now. So we don't have time to count every single bead. What are we gonna do? How are we gonna get an estimate for this proportion? All right, so when I say we don't have time to count every single bead, we don't have time to run the census, but what are we gonna do? We're gonna get a random sample instead. And you can hear that with all of these beads, the variable here is whether or not this bead was red. It is a categorical variable. So yes, it is red. No, it is not red, all right? And as you can see from that video popping up, when I crunched my numbers or when I, when I got my Dixie cup of beads and I counted the total number of beads and then the number of red beads, we saw that my sample proportion, all right? I had our number of red beads in ratio to our total number of beads we wound up getting 17 out of 95, all right? Or we got 0.179. Or if you wanna write that as 17.9%, that's great, all right? Now, was this number a statistic or a parameter? And you see in the bold here, it is a statistic, right? This was just based off of a random sample of beads. This was not the entire container, all right? So now we're calling it a point estimate, all right? So we're changing up our vocab because we've just added this in. Is this point estimate 100% accurate? No, probably not. All right. If I ran the census, I would probably get a slightly different answer or maybe I get a vastly different answer. It does depend. Sometimes we make errors in stats and we have numbers that are way off from what the parameter would be. So could this be close? Yes, it could. All right. And what I wanna talk about is what would we do or what what would we say a reasonable range of values for the parameter would be? And I'm gonna make up this margin of error, right? I'm gonna say, let's say we had a margin of error of 3%. And yes, it's the same margin of error I used back in example two, but typically when you're in proportion land, you get margins of error that are around two or 3%. But, but let's think about this. So I had 17.9%. All right, and then I want to take into account a 3% margin of error. All 
And for the sake of just making this slightly easier, I'm, I'm gonna round this and just say 18%. All right, when we actually work through the examples in this chapter, we can have um, as many decimals as we want, but just for the beginning one, let's go 18%. All right, and again, I wanna be clear, I made this up. Okay, we will get a formula in this chapter so that we can officially tell what the margin of error would be, but we're not there yet. Let me scoot all of this up so that we can, we can see it. All right, so we will get a formula in chapter eight. So for right now, I'm just making this number up, and we're gonna get a formula for this margin of error. That's what the MOE stands for, margin of error. But where I'm going with this is our, our statistic was about 18% reds. All right, but if I gave myself a 3% margin of error, I would say P, the true proportion, the one that I would have to run that census on, that true proportion is between, all right, let's see what it is. 18 minus three is 15%. Right, and 18 plus three is 21%. Okay. So what I would say is based off of my statistic of 18%, based on my little Dixie cup with 18% red beads, I think if I had run the census, I think the true proportion of red beads is somewhere between 15 and 21%. That's what I think, okay? And if you remember, and I, I'm not saying you should, the, the true proportion was actually 0.169. All right, or about 17%. All right, so when I ran the census, it really was 17%, and you can see 17% was in there. So my confidence interval, this is a confidence interval. This is a legit confidence interval. I estimated the parameter to be somewhere between 15 and 21, and it wound up being 17, okay? So I had a, a good working confidence interval, and that doesn't happen all the time. We have some, um, some assumptions and some structures in place to, to hopefully produce good confidence intervals, but, but things go wrong at times, okay? So when we get to the next page, it's gonna be a lot of formulas, a lot of me reading, and then we're gonna start crunching through some of these problems, and I really, I'm gonna hone in on the mechanics initially, and then we'll start to talk about why and what all this means. We'll build that in, all right? All right, thanks gang, I'll see you in a bit, bye.